Coach Peggy Show, all things wellness with Coach Peggy Wilms. How many people in your life have told you you're half of this or half of that? Are you settling? No more. This show is about all things, and you deserve it. It's about your money, your lifestyle, your beliefs, and even romance. We extinguish excuses and raise the bar to all things possible. It's time to use your ATM, you know, your all things mindset. Welcome to the Coach Peggy Show. Bold, badass, and never half in. Hey, you guys, welcome, welcome. I am your host, Peggy Wilms, where we talk about all things wellness and all things well being, all things real. We talk about real people with real problems, we find real solutions, and we tell real stories. So I have a real person here with us today. I want to first tell you that you need to stay around till the half hour mark, because I'm going to come out with some lightning round questions to my guest, Annie, who has no idea whatsoever that I will be talking about. And before we get started, what I want to say about today's topic is that at one, any point in time, one point in time, we all experience birth and death. And at one point in time in your life, whether it already has happened, it will happen. We're all going to experience grief. And that's kind of what we're talking about today is the told and untold stories about grief. And in my personal experience, before I introduce my guest here, um, you know, grieving is subjective, in my opinion. You know, we all cope differently. We need to respect those people and how they cope, whether it's a loss of a person, a pet, a job, a relationship. We're all going to deal with it differently and maybe each thing differently. I speaking for myself, um, I stink at grieving, but I've been asked in the last couple of years as two subjects that are going on in my life. And they've asked me if you've grieved through them or dealt with them. One is the loss of my mother who died of debilitating MS two years ago. And then the other one is I closed down my um, coaching practice by decision of myself after 30 years of being a coach and in health and wellness and closed it down last year and kind of pivoted my direction to tell stories for the rest of my life. And they're like, Peggy, have you grieved through those? Have you worked through that? And I'm like, no, because maybe some of you guys out here out there can relate. And Annie's going to help us through this today, because sometimes for people like me, perhaps, where you look at it as data and you're like, someone has passed. Yes, that hurt. Let's keep going. Got things to do. Maybe you can kind of relate to this. So hi, Annie. Annie McDonald, welcome. Thank you, Peggy. I'm sorry to hear about your losses. And the first thing I would say is there's no wrong way to grieve. So you're doing fine. You're doing it your way at your pace. And uh, my philosophy is why make things harder by putting layers of shame and judgment on what we're experiencing. See, you guys, look, we're like we're like an Oreo cookie. We are see like she is just going to be this nice balance to me. Can you feel that left brain, right <laughs> brain, masculine, feminine energy going on as I sit here with my mohawk? Let me just give a quick quote. I, I give a quote every show with a, a quote that's pertinent to what we're talking about. So here we go. Grief is like the ocean. It comes in waves, ebbing and flowing. Sometimes the water is calm and sometimes it's extremely overwhelming. All we can do is learn to swim. That's a quote from Vicki Harrison. Do you like that quote, mm-hmm. Annie? Isn't I love that, cool? that quote. Yeah, I love that quote. And I think you can even learn to um, not just swim, but maybe surf. And sometimes have right. a little fun with the process. Yeah, because you know, you can still live in the ocean if you just know how to float. Mm-hmm. You don't necessarily have to know how to swim. Let me um, brag on you for a little bit because not everybody will tell me when I say, tell me a little bit about yourself. <laughs> so let me just give everybody a, a few more details about you. So Annie McDonald, she is an acupuncturist, a sound healing practitioner, and a grief guide who teaches self-care practices to nurture tender hearts and cultivate resilience through the power of gentleness. Oh, it just makes me want to whisper. Her virtual (laughs) sessions are tailored to help you get unstuck, tune into your creativity, and to reconnect to your inner calm. She offers free monthly grief circles, which is amazing, collective grief circles, and one-on-one grief care sessions. You know where I'm going to start. Do you have any idea where you know where I'm going to start? In order to be, yes, here we go. In order to be good at something, we have to have experienced it, whether firsthand or or witnessing it, right? So, you know, I'm going to go down this path of girl, how did you get here? How did you get here? So let's start with just a high level of that. Like, why do you do what you do? 
Why are you so good at it? Um, well, one, many things led me to becoming an acupuncturist uh, in my previous lifetime, and I still do it uh, as a practice. I'm a children's book editor. And in midlife, I took uh, what to many people seemed a, a strange left turn <laughs> into going back to grad school for three years to become an acupuncturist. And part of what led me to that um, came actually out of a grieving experience. Um, when I was on my own for the first time and had my first cat as like an adult where I grew up with lots of pets, but this was the first cat who I went out and adopted on my own and I was her mommy. Um, he, at the very young age of four, unfortunately, um, came down with cancer that ended up being very, uh, very swift. It was just two to three months um, that I had her after the diagnosis. And I went through a crucible of figuring out how to give her at-home care, um, kind of hospice care, and just going through the... It, People don't know the term very well, but there's a term called anticipatory grief, mm -hmm. which is when, you know, grieving doesn't just start at the death. It can start years beforehand. I'm sure you know with your mom, mm -hmm. there's so many losses along the way as you watch someone's health deteriorate and your relationship has to shift and change as, um, you know, with especially with the parent too, you may become their caretaker when they were always your caretaker. So um, I, I went through this, this period of grieving her, trying to cherish the time we had together and learn practical ways to take care of her and give her the best quality of life for as long as possible. And in that experience, um, it was obviously very sad and very difficult, um, but I found such emotional satisfaction in caring for her in that way and the intimacy and trust that builds up in that kind of caretaking. Um, and I learned about myself that I was more capable than I thought I was. Um, you know, when I was younger and thought briefly about being a doctor, I you know, kind of quickly ruled it out because I Besides not being completely on board with Western medicine, I also thought like, oh, I'm too emotional. I'll mm -hmm. just get, you know, I'll cry too much when I, you know, give patients bad news. And so I am still emotional, but I realized that um, I can stay grounded when I need to. And it feels really good to support um, support people I love and care about through difficult times and acupuncture itself is a really good way to relieve pain and calm the nervous system and just help anyone through difficult times so that that grieving experience was kind of like a pivotal moment where it took me a long time to commit to changing course but that was kind of like an emotional light switch for me Oh my gosh, that was all beautiful. I mean, it, I, it's, um, it reminds me of, I was actually comparing myself. I hate to do that, but that's, yeah, that's how you relate, right? Through stories, people. Mm -hmm. I was just thinking that everything that we do um, evolves. It's a beautiful fabric and kind of blends into each other and nothing is standing alone on the island mm -hmm. when we go through this life. But sometimes until we get way down the road, do we go, oh, that's why that happened. That's why I pivoted over here. That's why I was in that location. And when I did some researching on you, it someone might look in and go, what? How does that connect to like over here, connect to like over here? But when you think about the story you just shared with acupuncture and energy healing and sound, you know, it, using sound to heal and getting to the place, you know, through those processes, whether it's grieving or elation, whatever it is, those mm -hmm. energies flow. Um, when did you decide to make it a profession instead of just like, how long did it take before you went through this personal experience? And you're like, now I'm going to help other people through this process. Oh, it took a good 10 years or so. Cause yeah. I like, <laughs> I think about things for a long time and uh, it was a whole process of kind of, I was in a job that um, I liked, but was also 
very deadline oriented and high pressure. And I was really like, people don't realize when you're burned out, you want to change, but you don't have the energy to change. It takes energy to, to change course. Um, and I think I was also very tied up in knots with the idea that I had to have things figured out. Mm -hmm. So I spent years trying to map out like, well, if I do this, then what will happen, you know, five years down the road, just like, how can I, how can I afford this? How can I um, make this work time wise? How can I have the energy? And um, so what really helped me in the end, I did some energy work on myself in terms of, I don't know if people are familiar with uh, tapping, if emotional freedom <laughs> technique. So I did some tapping on myself and did some flower essences. And, and I was already at that point, I was already stu studying herbal medicine. So I was taking, you know, good herbal teas to like support my, um, my nervous system and just kind of like support my energy. Um, and I just kept, I just tried to stay open. Like, yeah. What what is what is it going to be? Like I know I want to do something. I know there's more for me to do in this life than what mm -hmm. I'm doing now. Um but what's the best way in? Do I need to do this step that's kind of seems like a side trip but that will get me more money to like then pay for grad school or just you know all the the ways we kind of tangle ourselves up in knots overthinking things. Awesome. And when I finally um, decided, my um, parents were getting older and they were having more health challenges and it really hit me on a new level that life is so short mm -hmm. and looking at them getting older, looking at myself getting older, even though no one likes to realize that or see that, um, I would just, you know, it came to me like, you don't want to regret not doing this when you get you like let's let's figure out a way to just it you know you don't have to have everything figured out yeah. what I ended up doing was was saying to myself I'm just gonna enroll for one semester of acupuncture school I'm not gonna tell anyone aside from my immediate family and just like a couple friends who wrote reference letters for me so like I'm going to keep this on the down low because if I change my mind or if I like fail at it, um, I'm using fail in quotes for anyone who's listening because there's not really such a thing as failure. It's just I, if I try it and it's not for me, you know, I don't okay. want to have made. Yeah, I don't want to have made a big fuss about it. I don't want, you know, to like tell people, oh, yeah, I quit grad school. So I'm like, I'm just going to do it very quietly, tiptoe in and uh, see what happens and so I did and I knew that like I could pay for one semester without having right. to like go into debt or anything and I had enough vacation time to kind of work full-time and go to school full-time for a semester because the school offered weekend classes and evening classes so I knew it would be difficult but it's like I owe it to myself to at least try and see what happens and once I was there you know I fell in love and it's the, I think there's, it's the Joseph Campbell quote of, um, you know, once you follow your bliss, the universe will open doors for you that wouldn't open for anyone else. That's and um, yeah, once you trust the process, once I got out of having to have everything planned figured out, out and figured out yeah. and just let things unfold, things exactly. did start to unfold. You know, when we think about, grief because I've worked with people for decades and so you know I've worked with a lot of people through these types of things we're talking about today and you know whether it is an animal you know a beloved cat or whether it is your best friend or whether it happens abruptly or over years in time I mean there's certainly difference I mean if I'll use my mom as an example if something had happened to her instantaneously she went to the grocery store and banned something in you do have that shock fact, different, you know, wave of emotions versus hers was about something that you said, and maybe I know many of our listeners will understand this is that when you flip roles, so I think it's mm -hmm. extending my grieving process, even if 
I don't, it's not even a grief. Like I'm not grieving in it, it, what I'm, what I'm experiencing is that the role flipped so much where I was like, you need to go to the doctor. Let's get on this medication. How are you feeling? What equipment do you need? Let's go be positive, sit up, you know, you hurt when you do this. Let's let me help you eat this. When you flip that role, there were so many, many deaths along the way, mm-hmm. like you said, like 500, you know, where you're like, mm-hmm. okay, she can't use hands to cook anymore or to crochet or, to, and there's all these just mm-hmm. things, you know? So for me, I think once it happened, it was like, been there, done that. Like, this is the best thing for her. She's in so much mm-hmm. pain. So when people come to you, how do you recognize whether they're doing well or have other ways they can cope with their grief? Like, what are some of the red flags that you see that are like, let's chit chat about this? Uh, Well, I would say, actually, there aren't red flags, unless someone is like drinking or doing drugs or doing something that is really harmful. Um, You know, to me, it's the best coping strategy necessarily to numb your out. And people do that in lots of ways, through food, through tea, you know, any, <laughs> through yeah, overwork. Working, I mean, right, yeah, like right. a, yeah, like a very common way um, people say like, oh, well, at least, you know, work distract you when maybe actually uh, what people don't, one thing people don't realize about grief that I like to emphasize is it's intensely physical. It's not just about emotions. Um, and especially if you're not an emotional person, you may not be clued into the subtle signs in your body. Your body is grieving, even if you're not, you know, crying and wailing and moaning. What happens is your brain has to rewire itself, basically, because your brain, you know, we're all pattern making the brain like most of what we do is kind of on a subconscious level because otherwise we'd just be paralyzed by information and decision-making. So the brain is very predictive and the closer you are to someone, whether it be the pet that you is at your feet 24 hours a day and, or a parent who's so integral to your identity and your Mm -hmm. everyday life, um, you have all these neural pathways devoted to your relationship with that person because our relationships Just are so yeah our, yeah, rela- exactly. yeah our relationships are so key to our sense of safety in the world and how we understand the world so what ha- actually happens is in the in the background like almost for months after a death your brain is using a lot of energy to just make sense of the, the new world mm-hmm. And what do I, what do I now do in the grocery store when I'm not pulling her favorite food off the shelf? What are you, that's why like grief will catch you in so many little moments where it will just hit you like a gut punch because your brain has a pattern and it's like, well, well, wait a minute. Now it's like the floor drops out beneath you again, because you have to rewire you. You really have to figure out who you are who you are in relationship to I mean it's not just you know when a parent dies you also often have to renegotiate relationships with your siblings or with your own children who have watched you who are grieving a grandparent and or watching you grieve a parent so really so much so much ground shifts beneath you that um, that really is part of the grieving process it's not just about like oh did I cry today or did I do this so brain fog, confusion, exhaustion, memory issues, um, loss of focus, they're all part of the process. And so I, you know, encourage people to not push themselves to do what they think is the right thing. Like your brain, your heart, your, I mean, heart is another area where um, statistically, you know, heartbreak is like a physical phenomenon as well. Um, you do have a higher risk of having um, heart palpitations, arrhythmia, um, heart attacks, even after a devastating loss, because mm-hmm. your your heart is literally wounded. 
Um, so I encourage people to take care of themselves, to be tender with themselves and to not say, you know, it like if you need to numb out, that's OK, because it's too much to process all at once. Um, there's there's no like end stage to it where you can come to a good place. And then, like you said about the ocean, like a new wave will hit you of like, um you know, it can be a happy occasion where, um, you know, maybe your child is getting married and it hits you that your mother won't be there. So it's, I think of grief as like, um, well, it's partly like a wild animal where it's untamable and you just kind of like approach it with respect and um, you can kind of create a relationship with it where it's not going to knock you off your feet but you can just, you know, roll with it at your own pace. I, I love everything that you just said. That's why I'm sitting here nodding my head because some mm -hmm. shows really resonate with you and others mm -hmm. you're just like, you know, and <laughs> so this one, I really didn't think about it till I was preparing for it the last couple of days. I'm like, oh, this might be like one of those shows that align with you, Peggy, because you're going to actually you know, like really connect to it or really learn something. One thing that you had said that I hadn't thought about before is my physical body, any of us listening, mm -hmm. um, you know, I tend to look at grief as an emotion. And so you said something mm -hmm. about even if you're not emotional, I may not be mm -hmm. emotional, but I still have those emotions. But I look at mm -hmm. grief up until you just chatted um, as this coping that I needed to do psychologically, or, you know, it was more mental, mm -hmm. like a mental mm -hmm. reprogramming, like get over it. But I didn't realize, I didn't make that connection that you said about the physical vessel harboring and holding that, you know, adrenal gland, that fight or flight of like just mm -hmm. being like this, waiting for the call. Oh my gosh, for five years. Yeah. And the aftermath of that, it's like a volcanic eruption almost. It's just the lava is just sitting there and every, it's like you said, I mean, sometimes you're, you know, your neck may hurt and it may not. Mm -hmm. and the next day you may cry because your mom didn't call and you wish. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. I ever. I had a thought when you were speaking about age as it relates to grief and being five years old and losing your, you know, best friend or kitty cat versus being 20. Is there anything that you can tell us in your experience you've seen with age and loss and grieving? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, well, you know, every person is different uh, and every, for like you said, beginning, every loss may be different for each person. Um, and sometimes if you tuck away some grief with one loss, another loss will come along a few years later and it, you'll feel the, the resonance, like grief kind of echoes on itself. Um, but for, uh, I think for anyone, but especially for children, um, creativity is really important and storytelling. Um, you know, the younger you are, the, your, your understanding is different. So there are some great children's books about um, grief and the kind of invisible connections that we maintain to the people we love. Um, any kind of like art project to, because again, like you said, I one of the misconceptions I like to um, talk about is this idea that grief, you know, if the most help anyone will usually suggest is like, oh, here's someone to talk to, or here's like a therapist or a counselor. And sometimes when you're deeply grieving, talking about it is the last thing you want to do. And it's not the time to overanalyze either. Um, so anything artistic is a really good way to just let your emotions flow the way they want to, whether it's singing, whether it's dancing, whether it's, you know, doodling or doing painting. Um, and for children, especially, I think that's a helpful way in to let, you know, they're going to process it in a way that adults won't necessarily predict or understand. Mm -hmm. So it's important for adults to just be a steady presence and um, let, let the child know it's safe to talk if they want to talk, but they don't have to talk and maybe look for some stories. There are some great, um, there are a couple websites. Uh, the Doogie Center is one of them where they have um, 
I'm pretty sure they do virtual grief circles now. Um, they have grief circles for different age ranges because it's very important to feel understood by other people people who are going through it so if you have you know if your classmates can't relate but you have an online grief circle of some other kids who might have lost a parent that can be very helpful um and the other thing i'd say too is that um we continually process loss as our own awareness and understanding changes so if you lose someone as a child you'll it's called regrieving you'll regrieve at different developmental stages as it hits you in different ways. Yeah. So that can be true for, you know, adults can be grieving something they lost decades ago because it hits you in a new way. Well, and I think when you bring up storytelling with children, they don't yet know, they haven't experienced enough of life to know what really death is at that point, mm -hmm. where when we're 25 or 30 or 50, we know that happens, obviously, or has happened many times to us. Um, but at four years old, you haven't watched enough sad movies. But I think you bring up a really good point that it is it is all about storytelling and, and really what happens at that point. And so that four-year-old is then 14 is in 34 and you start to realize like, you know, dad's not walking me down the aisle. And I mean, mm -hmm. so it, it does have this periodic kind of chunk going along that can pop mm -hmm. up. It, that's a really good point. Cause I think most people that I are in my circle will say that I didn't know it was going to hit me. It hits me at random times. Mm -hmm. You know, I, that, mm -hmm. I could be really happy and then blah, blah, blah. All right, Sierra, I'm going to go ahead and have you take us to break. You guys make sure that you do come back. We're going to have a little fun lightning round, and we're going to continue to talk about grieving and how we can heal through that. So you're watching the Coach Peggy Show. So make sure you come, show me sure you come back. Hey, you guys, I want to welcome you back to the Coach Peggy Show. Thank you for um returning. We're going to do a quick light. I always love to do these lightning rounds because it just kind of breaks it up today kind of can feel like a heavy subject. We're talking about grieving. I've got Annie McDonald here with us and I'm learning lots of things myself. So I want you to stick around and make sure you stay till the end of the show because I have a really cool couple of giveaways for you. But the lightning round is just to, you know, shake it off and have a little fun. So, okay. So here we go, Annie. I want to know what's on your nightstand next to your bed. Uh, well, there's a reading lamp. There's always a stack of books. Uh, there are a couple crystals. And uh, I think that's it. Sometimes there might be a glass of water. That's more fun than mine. I've got some cough <laughs> drops, my earbuds, and a fan. And I, <laughs> that's really boring. <laughs> okay, you guys, I know you're listening. Some of you out there are just all hyped up about this. Taylor Swift, Kel Travis Kelsey relationship. I'm not going to bore Annie with it, but um, do you know what I'm talking about, Annie, at all? I do know Taylor <laughs> Swift, and I have seen the the picture. I don't know the football player, but I've seen the pictures of them together. Well, I tell you, I've, I've just got to Sierra, my producer. She's popping in. I see her popping in. Come talk <laughs> to me, Sierra. This is lightning round. So um, I think it's hilarious. Apparently, nobody knows who Travis Kelsey is until Taylor Swift showed up at his game. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> All right, I have one more he'll, quick question. I was I'm, being I'm sure sarcastic. He'll, he'll soon be a song, I'm sure. If it's a good relationship, <laughs> she might dry up a little bit and not write us so many lovely things. I hope it does yeah. work out because they're they're pretty cool. All right, I have one more question, lightning round question for you. Is there a conspiracy theory out there that you believe in? Something uh, you've heard. I'm pretty conspiracy theory minded. I am fascinated by them. So I definitely say the, I mean, the obvious one is the JFK assassination. I don't believe the lone gunman theory. Another show. Oh my gosh. And aliens do exist. And I thank them for following me every single day. <laughs> All right, you guys, we're going to um, come back to this subject. While we were off, um, chit-chatting during commercial, we were chatting about how this subject is one of those that we don't sit around the kitchen table and go, oh, let's talk about grief. And how do you think you're going to feel when Nana dies? We just don't tend to, to do that. And on the other side of grief, um, for me personally, is once my mom passed, I, 
realized that I had been kind of caretaking that piece, but also caretaking my dad, who was caretaking my mom. And so then when my mom passed, and then I'm helping him with his grief and everybody else around in all of the things you have to do, like all of the arrangements. And then now with my dad, you know, let's do the will, let's get all this stuff, because I don't you know what am I? Mm -hmm. It it just can. I mean, two years have gone by. That those decision making mm -hmm. things after grief. So, what are your thoughts on? Can anybody prepare themselves? This subject's hard to talk about, but prepare mm -hmm. yourself through the self care, like you said, the healing, the joy that you mm -hmm. bring to the world. Annie, can you help us with that? Um, yeah. Well, I love to do sessions with people in, I, I have a lot of experience with anticipatory grief also with my parents at the end of their life. Um, and also caretaking a lot of senior pets. Um, so one of the things that I find helpful for people is just very simple nervous system practices where, um, a, over a virtual session, I can show people some just simple Qigong which is from Chinese medicine. It's a very like a very slow moving um, meditative practice. So, you know, there are ways to just gently move your body, breathe, use sound even um, to just get some emotion flowing in a healthy way when you feel like kind of tied up in knots and you don't know where to turn. Um, and also often these practices help regulate the nervous system. Because I know when I was... Um, in a situation where, uh, you know, I wasn't, my parents were in an assisted living facility. So there was a period of time where I was a direct caretaker during an emergency. And that was one of the scariest times of my life. Was like every time my mom would get up and the danger of her falling as she hobbled to the bathroom and just all the things that you know that can go wrong <laughs> and that just mm -hmm. can spiral rapidly with an elderly person. Mm -hmm. So um, even when I wasn't directly there, my sister and I were getting, you know, phone calls and texts of, you know, whatever emergency, like, are we, should we take them to the hospital or we're, you know, we're doing this or what's your feedback? And also at the same time, I had uh, four senior pets who I would get off the train and walk to my house. And the time I was walking, I would just feel my stomach start to knot up because I didn't know what would be waiting for me when I opened the door. Right. It might be a pile of throw up. It might be, um, you know, an accident. You know, I might have to rush them to, or they, you know, God forbid they might something might have happened to them and one of them might even be dead when I walk through mm -hmm. the door. Um, it was just, you know, there's no controlling some situations. So anything that you can do to just in that moment, give yourself space to take a breath, to calm yourself. So you're not reacting from a place of panic. Um, and it's, you know, it's not like a cure all, but it's, a way to ride the waves of yeah. just let me let me get through this moment um and there are you know different ways to to play with it too where in terms of like using sound therapy mm -hmm. um when i would come home and <laughs> when there would be one of my dogs had you know like chronic really bad urinary infection so there would be like this horrible smell when I opened the door in the summer because this puddle to clean up and you know it's just miser a miserable experience and I had just had a romantic breakup so I was feeling like abandoned and alone and one of the things I did that actually helped me feel better was as I was you know getting out the stuff to scrub the floor and clean up the mess I would um, start singing and I'd start singing like a happy song angrily and just kind of like vent that frustration yeah. and um, just kind of sing it ironically and sarcastically. And then as, you know, like I cleaned things up and as I started to like be like, okay, what else can you do? This is, you're getting through this. And at least, you know, at least my dog is still here and, you know, she's okay in this moment and I'm okay in this moment. Um, but for me, like venting through song, and then, you know, switching the song to a little more upbeat when I felt ready um, after I got like the the angry sarcasm out first. Um, that was just and, 
you know, actually, when you look at it from like a nervous system perspective, when you sing, your um, breathing pattern naturally changes and it changes in a way that regulates the vagus nerve that just helps your nervous system calm down. So it's something that some people might do intuitively, but it actually is like something that I'll kind of prescribe to people of like, have you tried singing? Because it's therapeutic in so many ways that you don't even realize. There's two things that you were saying, <clears throat> you know, when we think about children, we start telling stories when they're in our belly and we start singing mm -hmm. to them when mm -hmm. they're in our, it's very intuitive. It works, you know, mm -hmm. whether they're two and you're singing twinkle, twinkle, little star, but that, that energy flow practicing those things and feeling and learning what works and doesn't work before you need it to me mm -hmm. is emotional resiliency at its best. When you're like, mm -hmm. this is how I feel when I sing. This is how I feel when I listen to this megahertz at night. This is how it is when I paint. And when you can, <clears throat> excuse me, when you can uh, try all those things, you're going to be more armed with what works or at least have that, mm -hmm. you know, that a la carte list that you can go, okay, well, that didn't work today. Mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> right. Oh yeah. I remember I did that in 1979. That was, you know, mm -hmm. really cool. But I like, I like what you said with, you know, just trying to sing and make it, make it doesn't even have to have the same emotion coming out. You think you could be rapping mm -hmm. and being angry as, as heck. Mm -hmm. I love that. Um, how long have you been doing working with parent uh, clients with grieving? How long has that been for you? Uh, that's, I've really focused on it just in the past year or two, um, since I have lost both of my parents um, during the pandemic, not related to COVID at all, but COVID made it extremely difficult. Um, and in that process, I was able to take time off. So I kind of went deep within to do my own grieving and um, not have to worry about showing up for other people. I showed up for myself, which I highly recommend if anyone's able to do it. Um, yeah. And in through, as I was going through that process, I began studying with different teachers um, to learn more about the grieving process and to both to help myself, but I knew that I wanted to help other people too. Um, and one of my favorite ways to do that, um, I did a program um, with the founder of Grief Yoga, so um, it's a, called the Grief Movement Guide uh, certification. And you know, you mentioned earlier where you thought grief had to be all mental and thinking about it and talking about it. But actually, you know, our body holds so much wisdom for us and so holds so much emotion for us. So um, movement is a really nice, gentle way in. Um, so that's um, one process that kind of, you can do individual motions depending on you know what you how much time you have and what you need in the moment but you can also do their like 20 minute routines that kind of take you through a whole journey of just like awareness of what you're feeling then kind of arcing towards transformation all with you know no you don't have to be able to put it into words you can just quiet down listen to like where in your body is feeling in need of some tenderness or some attention and just gently opening up a little space for um, expansion. And so much, you know, grief can often feel like a heavy weight on our chest. Mm -hmm. So just like ways to just kind of like open, open up this heart area. Because um, the, the one thing that I, um, in terms of like the way people grieve, and the one thing that does really make me sad is when I see people just shutting down completely where, you know, like the, the kind of person who will say, well, this was so painful. I'll never get another pet again, or I'll never do that again, or I'll never let someone that close to me. And so mm -hmm. what I feel of the real value in grief work is to keep your, your broken heart open to receive love in new ways from new people and new new pets and new places um because the more you know my practice is called joy alchemy acupuncture and grief and joy go hand in hand they're not exclusive and i find the more that you are willing to open yourself up to 
the heavier emotions, the more space there is to experience the, joy. the happier, lighter emotions. If you just freeze your, if you just freeze and shut down, you're, you're missing out on That's all true. the joy in life. That's true. You know, um, I, I was just thinking, I had a friend who lost her 10 year old child. And mm -hmm. that is one of the, her losing her actually made me closer to my son at that time, who was about four, four or five. And we used to go to Stephanie's grave and that's where my youngest mm -hmm. son, Tanner, and I used to, we started working on poetry and I would ask him to say mm -hmm. one word, whether it was, you know, bubble gum. And I have the notebook here and he, my son, who's now 29, he and I just wrote a children's book together. And I was just thinking about how the mom, Stephanie's mom, has never for years and years and years did not change Stephanie's room, right? Her mm -hmm. room remained the same as a 10 year old little girl. And I'm wondering why we judge each other. Is that fear? Why do we look at somebody else grieving process and go, why don't you put away her dolls? Like it's been five mm -hmm. years. Why do we do that? Um, well, I think most people have the natural instincts that like, we just want that person to be okay. We want them to get back to normal, whatever, you know, normal in quotes. Um, we want things back the way they are. And it's easy for us as an outsider um, because we're not experiencing the depth of that loss. Um, so I think one of the kindest things that you can do for people is to listen without judgment. And, you know, everyone does it differently. Um, that, that room that's, uh, you know, frozen in time may be uh, her peaceful place where she meditates and where she feels a connection to her child. So that can be very healing. Um, you know, like I said, unless you see someone actively, you know, suicidal or drinking themselves or doing drugs, you know, grief is very mysterious. And um, oftentimes the, you know, people think about like a time frame, but for one thing, you know, five days off work to attend the funeral is not even the bare minimum. As you know, there's so much paperwork and like people don't realize how much this paperwork is involved in a lot of death. So oftentimes the first year you're just trying, you're just like bare knuckling it, trying to make it through each like, okay, this is the first Christmas without them. This is the first birthday without them. This is the first right. this. You're just trying, you know, you're just clenching against like, how do I make it through another first without them? And you may be dealing with the shock of what happens, the trauma, depending on the circumstances. In your case, you may be recovering from years of caretaking you know, that took a toll on your adrenal system, on your nervous system. Um, so just building back your energy. And as I mentioned, like your brain is having to reconfigure itself. Um, so a lot right. is going on and you're having to make, uh, you know, sometimes sudden decisions about maybe you have to relocate if you lost a, you know, a primary caretaker, or, you know, if you're a mom and you lost one child, you have another child to take care of. You have to like kind of split yourself in two to like do some grieving when you can, but then show up for your other children or your other family members. So it's not going to be resolved in, in a year. It's, you know, some of this is a lifetime of work. Um, and especially when um, it's a, a death out of natural order like that, where you, you're not supposed to lose a child. Right. That, that especially, rem I, I wish society would remove all judgment from that because that's something that you don't want to understand how, how it feels. That's a good point. So, um, so they're, they're going to have so many milestones down the way that they'll always have an internal calculator that this is how old that child would be this is what they might be doing now looking around at all my friends kids and so that's you know um how whatever coping mechanism if it if it helps you to keep your child's bedroom the same I say that's right. that's right. wonderful that's there's nothing wrong in that and I do think that the storytelling which you know 
we relate on is that, you know, they always say, find your support group, or, I mean, you can have a self-help book. If that works, fantastic. If you've exhausted that and that doesn't work, then try as a support group. I do believe that there is so much healing and connection and Mm -hmm. finding positive solutions when we can just listen to somebody else compassionately, empathetically, that they've been through similar things that you have, you know, from a miscarriage, you know, I kind of, had that, you know, and I went on with that, you just kind of deal with it in different ways. But there are support groups, and there are Mm -hmm. ways to reach out. Not anybody, you can't expect everybody's going to knock on your door and say, I'm here to help, you Mm -hmm. know, it's that storytelling connection. So what would you say that we can give as a call to action this week, if if somebody is either experiencing grief themselves, Mm -hmm. or know of someone else, what's a call to action that we can assume? and move one step closer to finding joy through this tough, tough subject. Well, well, related to storytelling, um, one thing people may not realize, because I think there's an instinct to, to uh, you, know, you, you don't want to add to someone's pain. So you think like, oh, I won't remind them about this or that. But actually, you know, if when someone's grieving, their that per, their loss is on their mind. Nothing you can say or do is yeah, <laughs> really gonna no, is no really gonna remind do. them. Yeah. Exactly. But so one thing that that actually can be really helpful and joyful is to share a story. Even I mean that story you just shared of you and your child at the gravesite is so beautiful. I don't know if you've ever shared that with your friend, but I think that would be very meaningful to her. I think she did know at that time, now that I think about it, it was a coworker. Um, yeah, we used to show up and Tanner would take his Coca-Cola and she had one of those little urn flower, you know, flower vases mm-hmm. that were built into the headstone. And I'll, I'll never forget it when we were sitting there, he always wanted to know which way she was laying anyway mm-hmm. um, and because he wanted to kind of face her, but he would take his Coca-Cola and pour half of it in that a little base for her to drink right so <laughs> it's any yeah you do bring up a good point though it's it's sharing those types of stories that actually bring mm-hmm. us um you know with my dad certain things might come up and then I do the same thing that you just said where it's like oh I don't know I don't want to upset him he mm-hmm. seems like he's doing so well I mean you know this is I don't want to make it about me because you know there's part of that too where you're like mm-hmm. yo I know you lost your wife but you know like I'm the daughter too and or I'm the right. friend and there just kind of gets I'm not saying I was battling at all. It was just like, everybody's different in how Mm -hmm. it affects. I want to just go to um, one subject that seems not kind of related, but related. When you lose a childhood home or you lose a job, and those are all big events that you go through a grieving process to. Mm -hmm. And the same things that you mentioned that we can try with music and with sound healing and with Qigong or with yoga Mm -hmm. or with chatting. If you guys are suffering through those types of things, especially post COVID with your job changing, don't think it has to be a person or a child Mm -hmm. or, you know, or a pet. The grieving is very similar in your body, how it reacts Mm -hmm. regardless of the subject. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And there's, there's, Grief and happy occasions too. I mean, I think every, like, uh, well, not every, but many moms who become empty nesters will have experienced the grief over losing their, like, day-to-day relationship when the child was living with them, with the joy of seeing them leave the nest and go off on their own. But, you know, it's it's mixed. And True. you can, it's okay to acknowledge that. And there's so many so many you know perpetual changes and losses in life that if you do acknowledge grief you to me at the heart of grief is love you know we're only grieving because we love something or we want to love something so um i would say you know honor that love and give 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 grief some some space to move and flow rather than just trying to stuff it down or ignore it Absolutely. So what, I know you lost your, your pet and that was, was horrible. And then you lost your parents and now you're helping others grieve. What do you do? What's the best self-care protection and, you know, loving self-love thing that you do for yourself? What's your favorite thing? What works for you the best? Um, 
Uh, well, it may change from day to day, but probably the most consistent one is sound, where uh, I'll use my own voice or I'll use, you know, some of the singing bowls and tuning forks and other instruments I have to just, um, music is so instinctual and it just gets things flowing. That's awesome. Okay, where can everybody find you and work with you or ask you questions? How can they do that? Uh, my website is joyalchemyhealing.com. And on Instagram, I'm at Acupuncture Annie. So you can uh, sign up for my email list to learn more about my monthly grief circle or some of the grief care sessions that I offer. Okay, what do you see yourself doing in a year, Miss Annie? In a year, I will hopefully be um, letting the world know about a digital toolkit that I'm working on for people, um, you know, it, when it's 3 a.m. and there's no grief support to be had, this is a digital uh, library of resources for people to, to use. Oh, so yes. that it's not, it's, it's not ready yet, but hopefully yeah. in a year it will be out in the world. We got to keep leveling up, got to level up. You know, that's what our brain wants us to do is to keep learning and helping other people. Well, thank you for joining me. I'm going to do a couple of thank you house, so much. housekeeping things. Um, you guys make sure that you reach out to Miss Annie here. She is, um, she can, not she's going to cure you, but she certainly can give you some tools and point you in the right direction. And for all you guys that are grieving out there, my heart goes out to you. Um, we'll all be there at some point in time. It's just life, right? All right. I want to tell you guys, you can go onto my website at allthingswellness.com under the authors tab. Take a peek at just some of the fun stuff going on. So I've got the book I just wrote with my son, Tanner, the boy with the broken nose, and he is now a dad with two boys. And so we're writing some children's books and looking back on like, why'd you do that, son? And would you do it again? So it's super fun. I've got two books out for the All Things Wellness book series. Book three we're writing right now. If you guys want to submit your story to be a part of that, you can find out that information under the authors tab as well. And then another project I'm super proud of that's going on right now is a compilation book for those who are unsheltered voices from the street. So people who have been unsheltered, unhoused. Um, maybe they have been before, they are now. Maybe you're an organization that works with that population. Certainly reach out, become you know one of the people on our team. We really wanna change the narrative to what we think about when we say the word homeless really want to change that. So here's my giveaway for you. First five people who reach out to me and say they watched the show. And I will know because I'll come back at you and ask you what Annie said at 37 minutes. <laughs> but if you go ahead and reach out to me, the first five people, I'm going to give you an autograph um, book for Fourfold Formula, Wellness War, and Tanners in my book. So that would be fun. My upcoming guest is going to be Christopher Rausch on October 11th. We're going to talk about his story of being homeless for four years while he was a teenager with his mom. I can't tell you whoa story on that you can always catch me on the second and fourth wednesday of every month at 12 noon eastern and you guys thank you for joining me thank you annie thank you so much all right hon talk to you soon you've been listening to the coach peggy show all things wellness with coach peggy wilms tune in live on transformationtalkradio.com where coach peggy talks all things wellness not just nutrition and fitness but about all things, about your money, your lifestyle, your beliefs, and even romance. The Coach Peggy Show, bold, badass, and never half in. For more information or to connect with Coach Peggy, visit allthingswellness.com.